You know, we, we love the fixer up a program uh, where they go in and they renovate those houses, and then they take those houses that were just a mess and they, and they just turn them into beautiful show places. And uh, wouldn't it be great if these programs could go beyond uh, the physical house appearance and repair? Wouldn't it be great if they could show us how to repair and uh, to renovate the dysfunction that a lot of times is uh, so prevalent in our own homes? See, a lot of times we have problems with our children long before we know we have problems with our children. Uh, and they become, when, when the problems outside the home come into the home, that's a lot of times when we realize it. But a lot of times we have already had those problems, but either because of our uh, uh, reluctance to deal with them, or because of even our ignorance to the issues, and the, the business of life. Our, our children have gone astray long before the, the problems arise. Well, one of the attempts by TV, uh, our culture that tried to deal with this type of issue was the program Superman. How many of you ever saw Superman? It was on for seven years, and uh, Superman, uh, jo Frost, she was a Brit, and she would come into the home, and, and she was kind of uh, iron-fisted, you know. She would come into the home, and she would observe the home, how it worked, how the parents related to the kids, how the kids related to each other, how they related to the parents, and that sort of thing. And she would observe them, and then she uh, would instruct, uh, first of all, the parents, this is what you're doing wrong. In behavior issues. A lot of times it was behavior issues with the kids. And uh, this is how you're not doing with it right. And uh, she would instruct the parents and, and she would also instruct the kids and then she would help them implement changes that would help bring uh, peace and harmony and, and function to the home. Well, that's all well and good, but a lot of times when she was gone, and the whole plan would, would come apart. And uh, it was a well-attentioned show uh, that a lot of people thought that they really enjoyed, but it fell short of really uh, addressing the real problem. And ultimately, the show was canceled because of lack of viewers. And, and what happens is sometimes we get bored with doing the right things. We stop doing the right things and things revert to the way they were very quickly in our lives. And uh, so today we're going to be talking about families, in particular children. And uh, when we look at our modern culture, uh, we can see that the landscape of family looks drastically different than it did a few decades ago. A few decades ago, a, a family meant a mom and a dad and and their children living in a home together. Sometimes a grandparent would live there with them. Uh, but now the landscape of the home looks drastically different. Uh, it may be, uh, it may be a, a grandparent raising a child uh, because uh, their child uh, has done something or cannot have custody of the kids or different reasons, or maybe even have forsaken them. It may be a, a foster home where a family is caring for a foster child. It may, uh, meaning this is very uh, popular, uh, popular is the right term, but the most uh, that we see is a blended home where we're raising uh, our kids and our spouse's kids who are not ours biologically. And that's very prevalent today. And I'm not here to talk uh, negatively in terms of those who are divorced or those type of situations. Uh, but uh, the conflict that results 
a lot of times the blended families are is what I'm going to address at or at least the important part today. And and so there's just lots of difficulties. Uh, sometimes it's with your own biological children. Uh, you may be here and and in any of these homes, you are uh, really embarrassed to say how bad it is in your home with your child and the child that you're caring for. Uh, you feel as if you're living a nightmare and you uh, vacillate between guilt and anger. You feel guilty and then you feel angry because at, at someone who caused this. It may be the child, it may be uh, someone else that's been involved in it. And, and so there's lots of emotion that goes along when we think about today's family. Uh, there's not a lot of families, really, who are genuinely happy today. You can look at everyone that lives in the home. And, and so uh, today, I want to offer some help to everyone for every situation. You may not even be raising children. You may be an empty nester. You, you feel like you've done your time. Well, I've got something to say to you as well. You may be feel like, well, I'm not married. I don't have children. Uh, I don't know if I'll have children. I'll never say never. Uh, Tammy and I said we're not going to have children for eight years. And we had, then we had a niece that we cared for. And that just ruined us, Marissa. And, and so when, Marissa, when we no longer had Marissa, we had to have a hand. And, and then we said, oh, this is so great. We're going to have an Emily. And then we thought, why do we do this? <laughs> Just being honest. How many of you can relate? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but Emily's very sweet, very special. She brings a lot of joy to her home. Uh, but... Uh, Jesus had some things to say. We'll look at basically two statements that Jesus made. And then we're going to look at one that King David made uh, about children, about the home. And uh, look at these verses. And then we're going to make a statement about those verses today. Well, let's jump right in. The first thing that Jesus had to say that I think can offer any of us help today is in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 14. Jesus said this. Uh, he said, leave the children alone and don't try to keep them from coming to me. Now, the backstory of this, you read in a couple of verses before, people were bringing their children to Jesus in order for him to touch them or bless them or uh, whatever. And the disciples, they thought Jesus was too busy for them. Jesus does not have time for kids. Especially the way they, they thought. Uh, he's too important. The kids are not that important. They're sort of second-class citizens. And they really don't matter. That's the attitude of the disciples. And so Jesus says, leave the children alone and don't try to keep them from coming. Because the kingdom of heaven is made up of people like this. Jesus would say, except you become as a little child, you shall never inherit the kingdom of heaven. You see, children have a natural inclination to want to please God. They have a natural innocence. And uh, I, I, you can bring a, a room full. We could fill this room up today with uh, first graders. And I could talk about how Jesus, and I could talk about how Jesus has a home in heaven and how Jesus, even how Jesus died for us. And you must receive Jesus in your heart in order to get to go to heaven. And that he loves you and he has a perfect plan for your heart. Wow. And I can tell you today, 100% of those kids would raise their hand and say, yes, I want that. Because that's the way kids are. They live inherently with the desire to please God. And by the way, your kids want to please you. You may think that they're terrible uh, and, and awful. They haven't gotten out of the terrible twos. They're a terrible eight now. But you know what? They really want to please you. 
And sometimes the way they act is to get your attention. And so Jesus says, leave them alone. Uh, and this is the cause of many problems in our homes today, is uh, people treat kids as if they don't matter. And sometimes we as parents do that. And particularly when we divorce and we say, well, the kids will be okay. Or the kids become a bargaining chip. Or a, 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 a someone to tell you what's going on with mommy or with daddy. See, you're using that child as if they do not matter. Kids matter. That's my first statement that we drop from this. Kids matter to God. If they matter to God, then they should matter to us. Now, there's a lot of terrible things that takes place. Uh, children are abused in this world, and none of us can understand that. Most of us would be quick to say, somebody that hurts the kids, they should, they should get it. The kids are forsaken. A lot of times, the actions of adults result in kids being neglected and even no longer able to live with their parents. Drug abuse, alcoholism, just loving self more than they love the kids. It results in hurting the children and keeping them from coming to Jesus. Because all these things have an effect on the child's heart. Because when a parent does the opposite of what a child in their heart knows is right, it throws that child into a paradox. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to reconcile those two differences. And so naturally, they are hindered from coming to Jesus. He says, do not hinder them. Kids matter. This takes place in blended families as well. Blended families sometimes, people will resent the child of their spouse because that child reminds them of their spouse's ex. But that child is not, it's not that child's fault. They have the tendencies of their father. It's not their fault. It's not their fault that they don't know how to react with someone else taking their mother's place. It's not their fault that they don't know how to respond to these things. And so children need understanding, they need love, and they need to be thought of as important. Kids matter to God. There's a second statement that Jesus made. I think it's very powerful. Uh, it's in uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. Look what he said in Matthew 18, verse 6. He says, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it will be better for him to have a great millstone. A, a millstone is a big old piece of stone uh, fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. It would be better for that person and what he's saying here is, it's better that they suffer now rather than face me in judgment and be surprised that I have this against them. Basically, what he's saying is God will harm the ones who harm the kids. I want you to let that stick in your mind. God will harm the ones who harm kids. And most of the time we relegate that to people who abuse kids. But I want you to know that we harm our kids when we do not teach them uh, to do what they naturally know to do in their heart. That's love God. When we take our kids 
Kids, I know we should go to church, but uh, Daddy wants to go to the lake today. Now, I'm, I'm not one of those people that, that want, thinks that uh, if you take a day off and, that you're going to die and go to hell or it's the worst thing ever. Because we're not under the law. But I'm telling you, our actions do speak louder than our words. And if, the, if, if we miss church more than we go to church, then we are telling our children that something is more important than God. Now, I know it's really touchy when I start getting on the subject of travel ball and weekend tournaments. And you can, you can be mad at me if you want, but I love you. I love you and I'm telling you the truth. You're teaching your children the opposite of what you say you believe. You're teaching them by your actions. And they learn by, more by your actions than by your words. And it's not just that. It's, it's, it's everything that you do. Whoever causes. You didn't say the bad people who cause. But whoever causes. Whoever causes the little ones who believe in me. We see that statement again. Because kids naturally <laughs> believe in Jesus. They naturally have that inclination. And if we do not foster that and help them that, and if we hinder that, then we are hindering them. We are harming them. And God will harm the ones who harm the kids. Very clear. It's right there in the words of bread. Jesus said it. And that's exactly what it meant. He's not giving us a, a, some sort of antidote or some sort of metaphor. It is clear. He means what he says. Well, there's a third statement. Not only kids matter to God, and God will harm the ones who harm the kids. But this third statement comes from King David. And David should know a little something about this. I'll relate to this later. Uh, and he's given instruction to Solomon. Solomon was a child he had laid in life. After he already had several wives. Solomon was the son he had by Bathsheba. Here's what he says to him in Psalm 127, verse 3. He says, children are a gift from the Lord. And the King James says they're a heritage. And I like that word heritage. I think that, that carries the great idea that they are what we pass on. And God gives them to us as a heritage from the Lord. They're a gift. They are a reward from Him. And so as a result of that, we realize that, that kids should be valued and treasured. But look what he says in the next verse. Children born when you're young are like arrows in a warrior's hand. Arrows. What do you do with arrows? You'll just randomly, you point them, you aim them, you direct them. And so children are not only to be treasured and valued, they're to be aimed and directed. And so that's my third statement. Kids matter to God. God, God will harm the one who harms the kids. And kids are to be valued and directed. Now, having said all that, those are the three statements. Those are the three foundational statements. I want us to take these three statements and I want us to apply those to our world today. Here's what I want to do for the next five minutes or so. I want to talk about the different types of families. Uh, we'll talk about biological lives. But blended families, I've already touched on it. But blended families are not anything new. But you shouldn't be ashamed if you're a part of a blended family. You can't change the past. You can't go back and undo what was done, even if it was your fault. A lot of times it's not. But you can't change it. But it does not mean your life is over. 
And so a lot of times there are blended families. There are families with a mom and a dad who have kids that sometimes are referred to as step kids. I heard somebody say, we don't call them step kids, we just call them kids. We just claim them all. And I think that's wonderful. But uh, it's not anything new. But blended families, you know it's not new, it's different. And it's not going to be easy. Some of you could attest more than I can know to that. But when we look at the scriptures, there are a number of instances about blended families. The first one you think about is Abraham, the father of our faith, you know, that, that Abraham. Abraham, he blended two families together. Remember he had Sarah, and he waited on Isaac to be born, and he gave up on Isaac being born, and he entered into a relationship with Hagar, and Ishmael was born, then, then Isaac was born. So Abraham blended two families together. He's like a lot of people today. He blended two families together, and it was troublesome, to say it best. In fact, those two families are still fighting to this day. So it takes a lot of faith and a lot of love. And I'm going I'm to sum up today with how you can do these things. If you're in a blended family, don't be discouraged. Families who do succeed will tell you that the struggles work. And the fact that you love every child in that family, whether they're yours biologically or not. And so, uh, blended families are very prevalent in our society. And so we've got to look at how the Bible applies to where we're at. Not just that ideal family. Mom, dad, and kids. But blended families. Then there's a second type of family I want to talk about for a second. And that's a foster or adopted family. We celebrated that this morning. Uh, with, with Jeremy. And in my opinion, foster or adopted families are the heroes in our society today <coughs> because they are caring for those who have no one to care for them. And let me just say, the church should be taking the lead on this. We shouldn't be waiting on DFACs or some government agency you say, well, they'll find somebody. The church should be more involved in this than any other area of government. Because it's at the heartbeat of our life, of who we are as people. You see, the Bible says in Psalm 68, I think we've got it on overhead, God uh, is a father to the fatherless. And he's a defender of the widows. He says, this is God whose dwelling is holy. Look at verse 6. God places the lonely in families and he sets the prison free and gives them joy. You know, a lot of, a lot of children are prisoners to a system. If only they had somebody to care for them. It's not their fault what their mommy and daddy did. It's not their fault where they're at. And so, uh, foster or adoptive families are heroes in my book. In Whitfield County, there are over 300 kids in foster care right now. But there are only 34 homes. Now, do the math real quick. Most of you can do that. 34 and 300, that's over 10 per home. We can't do that. So as a result, we've got kids as far away as South Georgia. And if a family is working on a case plan, a mom and dad, they're working, they're getting their life back together, they're doing the right things to get their kids. If they get to see, have visitation rights with their kids, you know what they're going to do? they got to travel to South Georgia. Do that. And not only how it affects mom and dad, but how it affects those kids. They, as a result, can't see mom and dad as often as they need to. 
I'm telling you, our hearts should be touched with this matter because kids matter to God and God will harm the ones who harm the kids and they are to be valued and directed. And anyone that calls himself a Christian should see that above anyone else. According to the Apostle Paul, we've all been adopted. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 tells us this, he says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. By the way, can I tell you something? Children do bring life to a home. They may make noise, they may make mess, but they give great pleasure. I mentioned earlier that, that uh, I said we have Hannah, and then we had Emily, and we thought, why did we do this? But I want you to know, Emily, as hard-nosed as she was and as difficult when she was little to, to deal with, she gave us so much joy because she has such personality, such vibrancy about her. And, and, and so you take the good and the bad, and you take joy in it. But most of us aren't willing to take the bad. And we miss all the good. Sometimes we don't want to raise somebody else's child. We just want them to discipline them and them to deal with them. Friend, I want you to know when you become a family, you do things together. Mom and Dad, they're all your kids. We need to love them and treat them. Fairly and justly and according. In the Roman culture, when you were adopted, you uh, became a, literally a new person. You received a new name, just like Jeremy. I can't even remember her old name. What was it? Marley. Marley. Well, she's been Jeremy to me even before the adoption was signed. But she's Journey Faith Arnold. She'll always be Journey Faith Arnold. She got a new name. She got a new identity. And that's what it means to be adopted. I think about the Gillen family. And I think about, uh, they had those three strapping boys, Carter and Cole and, and Cody. And, and what a great family they were. But then God burdened their heart to go get care of. And then Kylie. And I think, you know, their family wouldn't be whole without Kara and Kylie. And I, and I look, and Robert will post a lot of pictures on Facebook when he's doing things with the girls. And I think, you know, they just belong together. And I, occasionally I've seen pictures of just the boys with those girls. And I want you to know those boys love their sisters. They're not stepsisters. They're not adopted sisters. They're sisters. And they love those sisters. And those two sisters, they love their big brothers. They're a family. God wants to restore families. He's the Father. That's who He is. And it's God's heartbeat that we get that. That we, that we should get His heartbeat for that. Doesn't it make sense for those of us who have received so much have been adopted by Him, been cared for Him all the days of our lives that we should want to see that others care for. I tell you, this sermon really got next to me this week. It really challenged my heart. I read uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman's book uh, when it came out of his hour a couple months ago. He tells in the book about adopting Johanna and then uh, what was the second one's name? Stephanie and then Maria the three, after he had uh, two, three kids of his own and then they adopted three. And he tells about that story. It's just a powerful, powerful story. I recommend you get it and read it. You will be touched. I'm telling you, your heart will be touched. You read how God worked in their lives. 
even through the trash. But you see, James defines the quality of our faith by how we care for those without parents. Look at James chapter 1, verse 27. I'm almost finished. He says, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, Father, means caring for the orphans and widows in their distress. Refusing to let the world corrupt you. What's he saying? He's saying that if we don't take care of children, we're corrupted by the world. Now, how are we corrupted? We're corrupted by comfort. We're corrupted by materialism. We say we don't have any space, we don't have this, we can't do that. It's not convenient. I want you to know compassion is never convenient. Never is compassion convenient. But I can promise you today that your life is enriched. Amen, Jordan. Your life is enriched. If you reach out. You know, Jeremy's not the first one they cared for. Okay? They touched a lot of boys' lives. Those boys thrived with them. They saw them get healing and help. And so it's not easy. But if God moves on your heart about this matter, fostering or even or not, there are 147,000 kids in the foster care system of the U.S. who are adoptable right now. I don't have any in there with the county. 127,000. Not to mention millions that are worldwide. You say, well, we can't afford it. Friend, I want you to know God will make a way. If God calls you to it, He will provide you all you need for it. about the gospel, how their lives have been bridged, bridged by foster. And I have legal custody. See, someone said this, when we foster or adopt, we change the world one child at a time. And then finally, Biological children. You have your own biological children. Maybe you don't know what to do with them. I'm going to give you something that will apply to you, but maybe you could add a brother or sister to that home. The home would be richer for it. Is it with sacrifice? Sure. But if God wants you to do it. If he, if he burdens your heart, don't be afraid. Dig in and find out more. You may be an internist, but you still got love to give. Everyone can do something. I want to give you three simple keys that no matter what your house looks like, this will help you with kids. And, and, and we'll finish this, we'll do this very quickly. I put them in the form of an acronym. Acronym is all. Three keys is all it takes. Number one, accept. Or A, I still should say. The A in all is accept one another. Romans 15 and 7 says, accept one another just as Christ accepted you. So that God will be given glory. Can I tell you something? You don't get to determine what your child uh, is, is going to be after they get to be a certain age. You have to accept them for who they are. I can't make Emily be like Hannah, and I can't make Hannah, Hannah be like Emily. They're individuals. Accept your children for who they are. Never compare them to their brothers or their siblings or their parent, uh, whoever that might be. Never accept them for who they are. And love them for who they are. That's the second 
thing in the acronym, except and in love each other. First Peter 4, 7 says this, above all else, love each other deeply. The word deeply has a, has a connotation of intention, intentionality. It refers, it refers to breadth, the breadth and the depth of love. Is sacrifice. Show deep love for each other. Because of why? Love covers a multitude of sins. Your kids are going to disappoint you. They will disappoint you. They will do some things that you thought they wouldn't do. But they better know that you love them no matter what. And they can always come to you no matter the situation. They're going to know you're disappointed in them, but they're going to know that you're going to love them, take them where they're at, and help them move forward. Love covers a lot of mess ups. And number three, number L in the acronym, live out your faith. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 through 7. This is the last thing I'll say. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. You must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands. In other words, with God, there's no part way. There's no sort of sideways. It's, it's all or nothing. And by the way, the kids know if it's all or nothing with you. So you've got to live out your faith. We. He says, repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road. And most of us spend a lot of time on the road. When you're on the road, when you're going to bed, and when you're getting up. In other words, make the most of your opportunities you have with kids. Be consistent. Live out your faith. All it takes to correct a lot of mistakes are those three things. All it takes to set your family on the right path are those three things. No matter what your family looks like. They may be blended, they may be uh, fostered, they may be adopted, they may be biological. You may have a, a child that is uh, really not adopted by you, but you watch after them as if they were. Why do we do all this? Because kids matter to God. God will harm the ones who harm the kids. And children are to be valued, directed, treasured, and aimed. Nice to value it.